Welcome to the Stop COVID Deaths webinar series brought to you by the University of the Philippines. The Stop COVID Deaths shorts make it easier for you to go to the presentations that you are interested in. I'm Dr. Raymond Sarmiento, Director of the National Telehealth Center. And I'm Dr. Susie Pineda Mercado, Adjunct Faculty of the National Telehealth Center. Together, Together let's, let's stop, stop COVID deaths. So um, my presentation will be mostly focused on how we can respond to the different, uh, different vulnerabilities and needs of our teen pregnant uh, girls. No? So um, just as a summary, uh, these are the unique uh, vulnerabilities of our young girls, uh, especially for those who are younger than uh, for, uh, 15 years old, the bodies are not well developed. So they're short. We also have a very high stunting rate among our adolescents. That's about 26%. So they're short. The pelvis are narrow and small. So that's, that's why they are more prone to obstructed labor. Uh, also, 37% are nutritionally at risk. You know? So they have anemia. They're underweight. And so they tend to have low birth weight babies. And when they have a repeat pregnancy, which happens in 15% of all our pregnancies, you set up an intergenerational cycle of malnutrition. And we know the impact of malnutrition, not only in terms of physical, uh, physical impact, but also on the mental and uh, IQs of our, of our children and adolescents and adults. No? So those are the things that are really important. The interval between births for um, young girls is very short, 17 months. The advice right now is to have three years in between, in between pregnancies. So you see how uh, compromised they are in terms of nutrition. Now, um, this was also emphasized by Dr. Uh, JP, but again, I would like to emphasize that coercion is in the picture, especially if you have very young girls. So, Automatic. If they're younger than 14, you have to ask about, um, you know, relationships and the age of the guy who got her pregnant. Because uh, the PSA statistics itself shows that 70%, like three, uh, two out of three infants born of teen moms are were actually fathered by much older men. And um, also mentioned was IPV, that's intimate partner violence. We also need to screen for this because this is quite common. And it's no wonder that the postpartum depression can be high in this, uh, in this age group, no? in this particular segment of uh, adolescents. Uh, this is data from abroad, but I think we need to make our own studies here uh, in the Philippines. And what is uh, also difficult is that they have pre-pandemic, access is always very late. So usually we get them when they're in the second trimester, sometimes in their third trimester, because of course they try to hide the pregnancy. So they try to hide it uh, because of the fear of uh, reprimands and stigma. And so, and they don't, they don't eat well so that the tummies don't become bigger. So really it sets them up for all these disadvantages. Now this is, in the next few slides, I'll talk about our Teen Mom program, which we set up in 2000. Um, and this is basically, remember, the levels of prevention are two. Primary level, which um, there's a lot of plans that Dr. JP mentioned, though, that's preventing the first pregnancy. Our program in PGH actually is more on preventing the subsequent pregnancy, no? because they are prone to rapid repeat pregnancies. About 20 to 40% of them can have another pregnancy in the next two years. So this is, um, this is actually uh, mainly a partnership between perinatology, OB, and uh, pediatrics and adolescent medicine. Uh, but you see that we involved a lot of, um, a lot of the subspecialties and, and services in the hospital. So uh, because you the needs of a pregnant adolescent are multiple, no? So, so it's perinatology for the obstetric care, contraceptive services, very important, nutrition, and medical subspecialties like cardiology, because we do have a population of RHD patients or those with chronic kidney disease or SLE uh, lupus who get pregnant, no? And uh, we have been seeing also an increase in the number of 
those with multiple uh, congenital anomalies. So we call in genetics also for counseling and uh, other services. But what sets this program apart from any obstetric program for uh, uh, teen pregnancy, uh, teen, uh, for pregnancy is the psychosocial supports, no? which is mainly the work of adolescent medicine. Uh, we do the psychosocial assessment. We do the health education together with uh, OB. Uh, social workers play a very important role. Child protection also comes in because we usually if we ask the age of the partner, if it's a gap of four, four or more years, we actually uh, do a, uh, a referral uh, to child protection. And if we detect there's uh, depression or uh, suicidal thoughts, we also have a referral to child and adolescent psychiatry. So it's an interprofessional uh, service. Now, the thing here is that the approach is also unique. We use the adolescent friendly approach, which is basically strengths based. Uh, non-judgmental, respectful, focus on the adolescent's confidentiality and supportive of emerging uh, their emerging capacities. For instance, you see this picture, we interview, interview them alone, no? So that, that is respectful for confidentiality, privacy, and also the, this teaches them to deal with health workers on their own. Now, what is important is that we screen uh, for both the strengths and the risks. So we do the heads interview. And we ask about uh, relationships at home, uh, education, have they dropped out, uh, their activities, much time on the internet, but where that they're, they're, they're meeting their partners, um, use of drugs, uh, which is uh, alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs, um, in, uh, you know, violence in the relationships, depression, and suicide. And uh, with this information, we are able to do counseling, and uh, referrals to MSS, uh, Medical Social Services, and Child Protection Unit. And we also uh, engage the adolescent in uh, these major decisions. No? So decisions like, uh, will you raise the child on your own with your family? Uh, do you involve your boyfriend or your partner? Uh, are you thinking about adoption? And if they do think about adoption, we also involved MSS, no? because there's a, there's a lot of preparations here. But most of our adolescents actually opt to raise the baby with their families. Um, stay with your parents or cohabit with the partner. We discourage cohabiting because that sets them up for another pregnancy. And they are unable to go back to school. Um, resume or quit school. So it's so important to get them back to school. We tell them that there's no, they the school does not have any right to kick them out. That's against the law, no? and we can contest that. And of course, we talk about um, decisions about having another baby. Um, is that something in their agenda? Would you like to prevent that? Would you, what are your thoughts here? And we give them options uh, about the use of contraceptives. And um, the emphasis here is really for them to understand uh, long-acting reversible contraceptives like Implanon and IUD give them the space. You know, they, they can prevent pregnancy for three years. That's enough time for them to finish school, to breastfeed, for their bodies to recover. So this is very important that they understand how important it is to prevent a rapid repeat pregnancy. Now, we also empower them with uh, information as well as skills. So we do health classes. Uh, that cover this uh, that cover these topics and uh, we we this picture shows um, a class on infant care. We demonstrate. We ask them to do the actual diaper changing, etc. And also we emphasize breastfeeding because breastfeeding rates among adolescent women uh, mothers are quite low. You no, know, there's a lot of challenge uh, challenges for them. So we really support them in terms of information and skills. Now, we also supplement the lessons with brochures. Uh, we uh, go through a birth plan because they have to plan uh, where they're going to give birth. Uh, you know, are they prepared with the money? Is the pill health ready? Uh, do they have the bag with the clothes, etc. and the provisions. Now, because remember, they can't plan as well as adults. And so we need to help them build the skills. Not in planning and decision making. 
Okay, so uh, in 2014, um, uh, in Gender Health, Visayas Health, uh, with USAID, USAID funding actually uh, set up uh, similar clinics. They called it a uh, program for young parents, no PYP. So this is less stigmatizing than the teen mom. And uh, by the end of 2018, they actually had 33 clinics across the Visayas. Um, I think there are two in Leyte, uh, IBRMC and uh, Abuyog. And there's a big one in Iloilo. So, uh, so this was uh, recognized by the UH and actually given an award by NEDA. So I, 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 I don't, although I don't know what's happened here, no, because uh, the funding ended, but we really are hoping that the hospital would really pick it up and DOH would pick it up, no, and enable the other hospitals to have this program. So it can be replicated. Okay, so um, I'm almost done. Uh, just a few more slides. Now, this is, um, Dr. JP mentioned uh, pr problems with access, but this is really data from the NCR um, households uh, by UNICEF, a survey done in December 2020. And it shows that uh, fewer women were getting, uh, pregnant women, women were get, receiving fewer antenatal uh, care checkups. So this is pre-COVID, dark blue, 99% were able to get four visits. Now in the COVID uh, times, pandemic, 61%. So if you don't go for checkups, you are less likely to take iron and folic acid tablets. Um, this is, this is uh, also a little bit alarming, especially for teen pregnancies. No? Women are less likely to give birth at hospitals where they need to be no? for adolescents and more likely to give birth at other health facilities. Although at this time, home births were, have not increased. But remember, this is NCR data. We don't know what's happening in the provinces. Um, mentioned already was the access to sexual reproductive health services like FP, um, very low to start with, now lower. And this is for all women. No? So it's much lower uh, for uh, young girls. And um, remember the restrictive laws and provisions of the RH law, RPRH, that you need consent uh, to be able to access contraceptives. So that's something also that we need to think about. Okay, so in our experience um, in PGH, we noted a very marked decrease in the number of teen pregnancies that we, uh, girls with teen pregnancies, uh, seen in our teen mom clinic. So in 2019, the, we were able to serve 228 uh, young mothers, but in 2020, just 43 of them showed up. And this is understandable because we had to close and you know the services shifted uh, to COVID efforts. Uh, my fellows mentioned that they are starting to come in again. No? So this month we had, I think, nine referrals of instead of the usual two or three. Okay, so what happens is that they are admitted in the wards. Some of them, very few of them though, had, had, have had COVID. My fellows were able to uh, uh, see them uh, with precautions, of course. And they noted that the isolation is very, very tough for the young girls, no? And especially because they don't have gadgets. Uh, they don't have cell phones to, to keep in touch with their family. So. So it's very, very isolating. It's very difficult for these young girls who just gave birth and they, they're, they're in an isolation ward. Now, we also noted that there's an increase of sick babies left at the ICU. Of course, our, our statistics are skewed because we are a referral center. Uh, but uh, for instance, we saw six uh, mothers last month. Four of them had premature babies. And then we had one who had uh, congenital um, malformations. So that's just an observation. So no big data yet. No, it's just coming in. Now, what happened is that we sh shifted our, remember we have health classes. Uh, we shifted to online. So it's a, uh, we also shifted our postpartum follow-ups online. Now, the thing is that it's very difficult to gather them. Number one, it's difficult to gather them. Uh, they don't have the gadgets. They don't have the connectivity. And even though we start the calls and if our fellows are giving them load, they don't show up. No, for instance, this is a screenshot. Um, the ones 
these are the patients, two, and then the rest are doctors. So in this particular call, six said they would go, but only two appeared. So you can see the, and there's a lot of effort that goes into setting up an online consultation. Now, this is a, this is a postpartum visit uh, just to follow up on how the baby's doing, the breastfeeding, how she's feeling, et cetera. No? So we, we, we try to do that. Although we see this as an opportunity also because we're able to follow them up, no, which was very difficult pre-pandemic because they would not come back to us. So those are the limitations also of the program. Now, the challenges, uh, I, I think I mentioned, it's the physical access to the services and, of course, access to online services because we've shifted. No? Okay, um, key points, basically, just to summarize the unique vulnerabilities of our adolescents, um, it's both medical and psychosocial. Uh, we do have comprehensive at teen, existing uh, comprehensive teen pregnancy program, which is open for people, DOH to pick up. It has been picked up. Um, our, cha our challenges are obvious, no? Access to prenatal contraceptive, contraceptive services and online services. It's a big, big challenge. Although it is also an opportunity for them uh, to access our services and for us to reach them. So what can we do? Uh, Dr. JP has had a lot of um, a lot of plans, and um, and uh, you know it was very concrete. And I really say good luck, and please let's let's really move this forward. No, so for us, it's improving the connectivity, uh, both inpatient if they're isolated, outpatient. Uh, of course, family planning services should really be strengthened also. Um, have the COVID vaccine available for our teen pregnants no, when they're admitted in the hospital and other vaccines also should be available. Of course, uh, comprehensive sexuality education, um, you know, we should, we should uh, take care of the restrictive laws uh, of the RPRH. Remember, even though they are, they've already given birth, but they're below 18, they cannot give consent for contraception that's really ridiculous no and of course uh, expanding adolescent friendly services uh, which the doh has been really trying hard but we need to try harder thank you thank you so much for the opportunity to share my insights we hope that you learned as much as we did from that excellent presentation we also hope that you will join us every friday from 12 noon to 2 p.m manila time on zoom facebook or youtube so stay safe, stay connected, and, and see you online. online.